This conference will now be recorded. All right, welcome. Good to have you with us. This is uh, Sunday the 15th, and uh, we're ready for Doctrine 106. That means after today, we have four more remaining, which uh, will take us through the middle of uh, December. We should conclude around December 13th. That's the plan anyway, is to keep going each Sunday and then uh, finish Doctrine 110 on uh, on uh, December the 13th. Then we'll have about a four-week break before we resume again, and uh, we'll do the next module about halfway through January, um, and uh, and then run that for 10 straight weeks. So stay tuned, stay and watch your email for the uh, invitation. Um, I'll probably change the go to meeting link just because this one says Doctrine 100. Uh, I guess I'll create a new one for Doctrine 200 and uh, and let this link expire. I don't think I can change this link. It's uh, easier just to create a new room. So we'll uh, we'll look at that as we get closer. But for today, we got Doctrine uh, 106, looking at the judgment seat of Christ, the blood of Christ, the body of Christ. And uh, given those topics, uh, then communion seems to be appropriate. So we'll follow up the doctrine of the blood and the doctrine of the body of Christ with the communion, uh, as well as Passover. And what's the link between communion and Passover? So four good topics, and uh, we ought to be able to cover them real well in our uh, in our time today. So let me start with a word of prayer, and uh, we'll see if uh, let some other folks join us here. I see Ezekiel. Welcome. Just arrived from Cameroon. Excellent. Let me start with prayer, and we'll get started on our on our material. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your faithfulness, and we ask for your blessing upon our time. Uh, we ask, Father, that you would help other folks that are still on their way uh, to signing in, that you would help them to, to sign in and, and take part in our classes. We uh, know it's difficult sometimes in different countries and different parts of the world, and uh, of course the weather can be an issue and internet connectivity can have problems. But we, uh, we thank you for the blessing we have to come together today. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. All right. Well, I love the doctrine connected to the judgment seat of Christ because it is it is a great um, motivation for uh, being faithful. It's a great encouragement for uh, serving God. It's um, it's also very humbling and uh, and, and useful in, in those regards as well. So when we talk about judgment, I think it's useful to uh, to distinguish between the thrones. And this class does that. This lesson does that. Um, there's actually more than three thrones. Uh, but for the, for the purposes of this class, there are three thrones on which the Lord Jesus Christ will sit. And uh, so in the future, we're talking about presently, Jesus is sitting on a throne, but that's at the right hand of God. And he's not currently exercising the judgment functions that he will exercise on those uh, on those future thrones. And so uh, the one that, that we're centering on in this class is the judgment seat of Christ, which is the, the very next one to be convened. It could be today. I hope that it is after the rapture of the church. So as soon as the bride is complete and we uh, and he brings us to heaven, then uh, the first uh, thing that we, the first order of business once we get to heaven will be this uh, bema, this judgment seat of Christ. Then when he returns to the earth at the second advent, he will sit on the throne in Jerusalem. And uh, Jesus talks about this in Matthew 24 and 25. He talks about shepherd, separating sheep and goats. He also discusses the judgment of the resurrection of Old Testament saints, the resurrection of tribulational saints in um, Revelation chapter 20. So those, uh, those are good passages to be familiar with. Also in Revelation 20, at the end of the chapter, is uh, the second half of that chapter focuses on the great white throne. And um, this says in heaven, I went ahead and colored that red because uh, I think that's a, that's a debate point. That's a discussion issue. Uh, we're told at the uh, great white throne judgment that heaven and earth flee away. Heaven and earth flee away. And that um, interesting expression I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it from whose presence earth and heaven fled away and no place was found for them. And so this is uh, in between the destruction of the heavens and the earth and the creation of the new heavens and the earth. 
and in a sense it's it's kind of nowhere uh, no you know it's it's outside of created space because it's in the middle of, of this creation and the next uh but anyway that's uh that's a discussion point um whether it's actually in the third heaven in the presence of god and his angels or not uh i think is is uh not as clear as it could be in uh in the text anyway so distinguishing between those thrones is important and um what's useful is recognizing that none of these thrones none of these judgments determine whether you're going to go to heaven or you're going to go to hell that uh the fact is if if uh if you go to the judgment seat of christ that means you're a church age believer and your place in heaven is already secure and guaranteed and um in other words the judgment seat you stand before does not determine where you go uh your eternal destiny is determined by your relationship with jesus christ and then based on that is uh, the criteria for whether you stand at the judgment seat of christ or whether you stand at the uh, at the great white throne and so that's a, that's a huge difference and i think once you phrase it that way that resolves that resolves a lot of difficulty and confusion for some of these things the general principles though are true at all judgments and that is that we're accountable to god and whether we're saved or not jesus is the judge of the living and the dead and so we're accountable to our creator and uh, we are evaluated according to our deeds and not our sins necessarily, but our deeds. In Jeremiah 17, 10, I, the Lord, search the heart, I test the mind, even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. And this verse does two things, actually, which I wanted to bring out, um, because the deeds are emphasized, but then before you even get to the deeds, in the first part of verse 10, it mentions searching the heart and testing the mind. And what we're going to see very clearly is that it's the attitude that makes all the difference, whether you're in fellowship or out of fellowship, whether you're doing something for right reasons or wrong reasons. And so two people can do exactly the same thing. You know, two two brothers go to uh, or two sisters, you know, and, and they, they perform the same ministry. But if one is out of fellowship while they're doing it and the other is in fellowship while they're doing it, then even though they're both doing exactly the same thing, the judgment will be just the opposite uh, in uh, on the one hand you're going to have gold silver and precious stones and on the other hand you're going to have wood hay and, and stubble and uh, the, the fire will test the quality that quality is determined by the attitude as the heart and the mind is searched and tested so i like jeremiah 17 10 for both of those functions i think it it, it shows both sides of that um also there's jeremiah uh 32 19 that speaks of that as well unbelievers stand before the great white throne judgment which we've already seen unbelievers and um and resurrected saints and and that's a little bit more detailed than maybe we need to get into today but there will be believers who died during the thousand year millennium and so those believers will also be resurrected and uh and so it's not 100 percent unbelievers at the at the great white throne uh but 100 percent of believers do go to the great white throne does that make sense if i said that right so not everyone at the great white throne is an unbeliever but every unbeliever will be at the great white throne that's the better way to say that and then church age believers that's important believers in christ will be evaluated at the judgment seat so keep in mind that that's not moses and david that's not um old testament saints that uh at the judgment seat of christ that's only the bride of christ that's our uh that's our judgment in heaven as it relates to us in the church age old testament saints and tribulational saints they uh, they uh they get their judgment at the first resurrection judgment in uh revelation 20. All right. It is a, an evaluation of production, not sin. Remember, sins were paid for, sins were laid on the cross. Our sins were imputed to Jesus Christ and they were judged there. Uh, the Father doesn't ever want to remember those ever again because he, uh, he judged those when he judged his son. And so this is true for believers and unbelievers alike, even the unbelievers of the great white throne. It's not their sins per se that are judged. It's their production, their works, their deeds 
which are all in the flesh, which are all evil, that will be uh, be recompensed when those books are opened. I think it's a nice description here of Thaulos and Agathos, a description between bad deeds and good deeds. Some vocabulary help there. That the human good, which is all bad, <laughs> okay, wood, hay, and stubble. Remember, our righteousness is filthy garments, so nothing we produce is going to be intrinsically any good at all. All of our righteous deeds are, are filthy in God's sight. So everything we do when we're in carnality, in a carnal state, everything we do for the wrong reasons, everything we do to draw attention to ourselves. Jesus preached this. Uh, if you're standing on a street corner and preaching to be noticed by men, or if you uh, if you sound a trumpet when you uh, are giving money, throwing in the in the in the offering plate. Um, all those things, those phony shows to be noticed by men, um, that, that's wood hands double. There's nothing rewardable about any of that. Whereas divine good, the things that we do in fellowship, the things we do in humility, the things we do under the filling of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ, for the good pleasure of God the Father, all these things that, that we do that are pleasing in his sight are also rewardable in his sight. And so he keeps a record, and uh, this production is is recorded, is logged appropriately, and uh, and we can appreciate that. So when the fire hits it, uh, it is then exposed for what it is. And if we if we thought it wasn't going to be exposed, if we thought that we were faking it real well, and and our if our fellow human beings were were uh, impressed and uh, unaware of our duplicity, uh, certainly God was not unaware. He knew all about it. He knows the heart and uh, and he's able to judge appropriately. And so um, I think these passages are good. One other passage I was going to add beyond 1 Corinthians 3. Um, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, straw. So those are the building materials that we choose from. Six items that are mentioned in verse 12 that are clearly split into two groups of three. That the gold, silver, precious stones is on one side. Wood, hay, stubble is on the other side. And the fire is what tests it. The fire is what proves it to be what it is. And uh, because the fire consumes utterly the wood, hay, straw, but it purifies the gold, silver, and precious stones. And so this is what is what left over for reward. And I think it's also useful to back up just slightly and notice when Paul uses himself as the example here, he says, according to the grace of God, which was given to me like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another is building upon it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. And, and he's using this metaphor to try to uh, reached the Corinthian believers who were full of schisms and they were very divided. And uh, some of the church members were were uh, fans of the Apostle Paul. Others were were fans of of Apollos or or uh, Peter or uh, they were very schismatic in there. And and what Paul's trying to say here is, look, we're all just servants of God, and we're we're serving Him as we minister to you. And so I think that activity is useful, that this is a building activity. And if each man's work will be evident, if, if um, we, we have to be careful how we build. And so as far as the criteria that's, that's being judged, if we are careful how we build, right, then we need to be mindful. Let me call it that green there. Careful how we build. So we need to be mindful that what we're doing either builds up our brothers and sisters or it tears down our brothers and sisters that if we're building them up we want to put the best material products we can into our brothers and sisters as we build them up we don't want to uh, cheat them we don't want to cheat them by um you know trying to build them up with wood hay stubble and uh, when we're supposed to be building them up with gold silver precious stones and and that means that we're giving of our best. That means that we're considering the other as more important than ourselves. And uh, and that's really what gets evaluated is what are we doing as we edify our brothers and sisters in Christ? That's how we build up one another. And, uh, and that's everybody, by the way. That's not just 
the role of the pastor to edify the congregation, but it's the role of every believer to edify every other believer. And so in our fellowship, in our, in our ministry one to another, in our conversations, uh, we, should be, uh, we should be speaking the scripture, speaking the truth and love one to another so that every conversation is edifying to, uh, to uh, every other believer that we talk to in, uh, in this way. Also, uh, once you get past chapter three, I think when you cross over into um, chapter four, you start to get additional clues that are useful for us. Uh, and I did not see 1 Corinthians 4 or 5 in the, in the uh, Grace Notes chapter here, but you might pencil that in and just add this. Um, when he says here, uh, let a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. In this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy. But to me, it is a very small thing that I may be examined by you or any human court. In fact, I do not even examine myself. For I am anxious, conscious of nothing against myself, yet I am not by this acquitted, for the one who examines me is the Lord. And so, quite obviously, when you're looking at verse 4 there, the one who examines me is the Lord. That obviously connects us back to what we were just looking at in chapter 3 with the judgment seat of Christ and the fire which tests the quality of our, of our production. But then he says, um, therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. I love that. Disclosing the motives of men's hearts. I'm going to color that green as well. Because to me, that there helps us because that kind of puts the rest of the, the material together from, from chapter 3 in especially in drawing the differences between the uh, the gold silver precious stones on the one hand and the wood hay straw on the other hand is that it's the motive of the heart that really is the uh the either or criteria there and uh so then it says and then each man's praise will come to him from god so yeah go ahead and pencil that in i think right here after you have first corinthians 3 11 through 14 go ahead and add to that uh, chapter four, verses one through five, and uh, and I think those two texts go very well together in that connection. Interestingly enough, they don't. Uh, neither of those chapters actually mentions the uh, the judgment seat of Christ itself, which uh, we find in uh, Romans and in Second Corinthians, and uh, and so forth. But it clearly it alludes to it, even if it doesn't use the title. All right, any questions on the judgment seat of Christ? There it is, 2 Corinthians 5.10. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And then it's called the judgment seat of God in Romans 14 and verse 10. I believe that's the same thing as the judgment seat of Christ because God has given all judgment to the Son. So we can put those passages together as well. Any questions on the judgment seat? Thoughts, concerns, recommendations. Hopefully it's not a terrifying thing. It should be an encouraging thing. And uh, for anyone today that's walking with the Lord, that's living in the word of God, that's occupied with Christ, um, the, the judgment seat of Christ is just another day at the office. It's, uh, it's par for the course. It's, it's a normal part of, of living day by day with our eyes fixed on Jesus. I think the folks that will be not quite so comfortable uh, are the ones that shrink away from him in shame at his coming, uh, are the, the believers who don't occupy with Christ on a consistent basis, who don't live in the word of God, who, who visit it occasionally every now and then. Uh, but they're, they're really more uh, visitors rather than residents in, uh, in doctrine. And uh, so for them, where the, the bulk of their time is in carnality and the bulk of their stockpile in heaven is wood, hay, stubble, uh, I think for those folks, uh, there's there's reason why that they would be, uh, shall we say, uncomfortable. Uh, the promise for that, of course, comes in 1 John 2 and um, verse 28. Little children abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. And, uh, you know, this is the, the, the promise 
And when the trumpet sounds and, and Jesus descends with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, we don't have an option to, to not participate. Uh, we're all going to be uh, snatched. We're all going to be raptured and caught up to be with the Lord in the air. Um, and, but uh, it's not going to be a pleasant moment, at least at first, in that uh, twinkling of an eye when, uh, when these carnal believers uh, are uh, shameful and who uh, thought that maybe they had more time to maybe get serious about their Christianity and they didn't realize how short the time really was. And uh, so there it is. Now, also keep in mind that shorn will be short lasting because after that twinkling of an eye, we get our bodies transformed and the sin nature is left behind. And so when we are standing before the judgment seat of Christ, to me, the best promise of all is that we're standing before the judgment seat of Christ and we have no more sin nature. So we don't have anything left to be triggered, nothing left to be uh, to be reactionary. Uh, when when God pronounces, when Jesus pronounces his evaluation, we will be so like minded. And so uh, all the excuse making is over and done with all of uh, all of that activity is behind us. So. That's uh, maybe the, the greatest blessing related to the judgment seat of Christ right there. All right. Well, that's that's good. That's for that topic. We still have to deal with the blood of Christ, the body of Christ, and communion. And um, this one I'm glad we got to this week because we had some questions last week connected to this uh, related to um, the, the doctrines that we were looking at there. And I think Ed had a question and one or two others were asking about the blood of Christ. Are we talking about the literal uh, plasma? Are we talking about the, the fluid? The, are we talking about the, um, the actual uh, physical blood that was shed? Or is this representative of, uh, of something else? And that's what we find out. And we find that the blood of Christ, by the way, is not the only expression for that. There's also the cross of Christ. And when we talk about the cross of Christ, I was saved by the cross of Christ. I'm not talking about the lumber. I'm not talking about the wood or the nails or the shape that it was pounded into or, or anything else related to the physical structure of the cross. Likewise, when I talk about the blood of Christ, I'm not talking about, you know, the the blood type. I wonder if Jesus was O positive or if he was AB negative or what, what was his blood type? And uh, yeah, questions we can't answer, but people will wonder and they'll ask you questions like that as if, you know, the Bible doesn't tell us how am I supposed to know? But um, anyway, when we talk about the blood of Christ, we're not discussing literal blood. And this is why we got to slow down and be careful with this because you can, um, you can confuse the animal ritual, which was literal blood, and it was literal blood that was sprinkled on the veil. It was literal blood that was smeared on the mercy seat. And it was literal blood that was poured out in uh, in basins. So everything with the animals as a ritual, as a picture, used literal blood. And uh, it was representative of the work that Jesus would do on the cross. But we don't want to confuse... Um, his physical death with his spiritual death. And this is why it's it's worth taking the time to do this. Because if it's not explained correctly, or if it's, if it's explained poorly, I think some people struggle with it and then they um, you, they get opened up to criticism and, and, and other problems with, with other believers that have a slightly different doctrine on this. So let's, uh, let's take a look at it here today. Now, um, the, blood of, the phrase blood of Christ refers to the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. What he was doing as uh, the priest and as the offering, he offered up his soul as, as a uh, ransom for us. Uh, blood does represent judgment and the judgment for our sins while Christ was bearing them on the cross. So the father imputed our sins to him, but he also accepted that imputation. He volitionally uh, accepted it. He uh, received them, and he uh, and he served as a priest to atone for them. That was his priestly ministry there. Now, in the Old Testament, of course, we had animals, and they went through physical death. And uh, so that's a picture. It's actually an analogy. It's an analogous doctrine. And so we have phrases like 1 Peter uh, 2.24, he himself bore our sins and his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds, 
you were healed. And, uh, and that's true. He did. He was wounded for our transgressions. He suffered as it was promised to do, but it was the, uh, the sacrifice that he offered as a sufficient sacrifice to the father that produced the, uh, the satisfaction. Second Corinthians 521. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This is where uh, he didn't commit any of those sins, but uh, he received them when they were laid upon him. He accepted the, uh, the credit, the imputation of those sins that should have been credited to us. Instead, they were credited to him and, uh, and he paid the price, the wages of sin, which is spiritual death. Every animal sacrifice spoke of the work of Christ, and yet those sheep atoned for sin. They did not take away sin, not until the Lamb of God arrives. And John the Baptist announced this. He said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That is transformational. That is powerful. That is, that is what the Old Testament was looking forward to. Uh, there was no animal ritual that ever took away sin. The animal ritual, even when it was done correctly, uh, all it was was an atonement. It was a covering. It allowed for the, the covering of that sin, whereby God could pass over it and then uh, uh, reserve it for a future judgment down the road. And that's what he did in Christ. So uh, the difference between covering and taking away is theologically is huge. And, uh, and I hope we don't miss that in the class here today. This was, of course, prophesied that the Messiah would do this work in uh, Isaiah 53. The whole chapter of Isaiah 53 addresses this, but uh, verse 7 specifically says he is a lamb, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that is silent before its shearer, so he did not open his mouth. Oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. And I think we know he was under turmoil. We know his soul was troubled. We know that he was wrestling with uh, sweating great drops of blood from the night before when he was in the garden. We know that this was a, a tremendous work of faith on his part, trusting in his father as he went to the cross. And, uh, and it's, it's curious to me, I ponder, you know, what risk were we, was the whole planet in, in danger? Had he opened his mouth, had he screamed out, had he, had he uh, uttered a, a, a curse upon his persecutors? You know, how, uh, how nuclear of an explosion might that have been with uh, the creator God of the universe and the anguish that he was in. So he stayed silent through the process and we can, we can be uh, thankful for that. The animal, of course, had done nothing wrong, but he was judged anyway. Uh, in that judgment, the animal died physically. Jesus had done nothing wrong, but he's going to die anyway. And uh, the animal doesn't volunteer for this. The animal is not volitional. The animal is, is ignorant of, of the symbolism that it's communicating. But Jesus is fully uh, cognizant of what he is communicating. And he's very on board with the Father's plan. And he knows exactly what he's doing. And when he accepts the sin of the whole world, this is, uh, this is what he's doing. So the phrase blood of Christ sets up a representative analogy with the animal sacrifices in the Old Testament. So the blood of the animal is the shadow and the blood of Christ is, or the work of Christ on the cross is the, uh, is the fulfillment of that shadow. And so even though we use the phrase blood of Christ, we understand that it's an analogous expression, that it's not his literal blood, that uh, that literal blood, uh, you know, it dripped, from, you know, down his side and down the cross and to the ground. But that literal blood did not uh, anoint a holy place or didn't uh, didn't cleanse me. I wasn't even born yet. So it's it's a it's an analogy. And I hope we're clear on that. Any questions on that? Because some people get really weird on that. There's some bizarre theories about that. I've read crazy things about how, you know, before the temple was destroyed and Jeremiah took the Ark of the Covenant out of the temple and, and buried it in a cave. And then coincidentally, you know, that cave was exactly underneath this spot here on Golgotha so that the blood of Christ dripped down the cross and seeped into the ground and, and was sucked down into the earth and, and, and literally dropped onto the mercy seat of the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant that 
Jeremiah had hidden there, um, you know, all those years before. And it's it's um, it's goofy. It is it is absolutely uh, not biblical, and 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 not necessary in uh, in any point. Uh, to me, it's much more simple to show that when Jesus is on the cross and the veil of the temple is torn in two, he doesn't come off the cross and march into that temple. He just stays on the cross while the veil of that temple was torn in two to show that the work was finished, that the barrier between God and man is removed, that the uh, the typology of the entire animal ritual system is uh is obsolete and ready to disappear so uh, all the doctrine that we learn in the book of hebrews uh could be encapsulated in that event where the uh, the veil of the temple was was rent in two so after jesus work on the cross was completed he said it is finished keep in mind he was still physically alive when he said it is finished that's important because it was finished that the spiritual death accomplished our redemption so that spiritual death when he laid down his life and then you'll notice he took up his life again when he was done when he said it is finished he was spiritually alive when he said it is finished when he said father into my hand thy hands i commit my spirit that was a living human spirit that once again he had he had uh taken back up again the father had given him permission to lay it down and to take it up and so uh this was this was his work on the cross to uh, to suffer that spiritual death in our place and so uh, that uh, I, I tell you the first time i learned that maybe some somebody here today this is the first time you've ever considered such a thing but uh, but he did die spiritually on the cross that human spirit was separated from god the father and god the holy spirit and yet when, the, when that work was finished and the father was satisfied and the judgment was done and the lights came back on again i remember god had, had made the earth dark at that point then jesus took up his life again and uh that soul spirit that had been separated from from god is once again living connected to the father and uh and so we can appreciate that uh john 10 verses 17 and 18 the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one has taken it from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. And so, you know, the process, you know, who did what? The Father imputed the sin. Jesus accepted that imputation. Uh, the Father didn't take his life. Jesus laid down his life. And uh, Jesus lifted it back up again, took it back up again. So that's the spiritual death and life there on the cross. Uh, sometimes people mix that up with the resurrection three days later, how the Father raised him from the dead. That was three days later. For, that was raising his physical body in a glorified body uh, on, uh, on Sunday morning. That's different from this text here when we're talking about the work that he did on the cross. Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. And then he physically died. And I think that's important too, because that's something different. The physical death and physical resurrection is different from his spiritual death, the uh, the uh, payment for our sins and the uh, the work of redemption, the work of atonement, the work of reconciliation, all the the different works that he did on the cross in in several applications. Um, then uh, all of that was done before he physically died but the physical death was necessary and so he uh he submitted to that death next so after he died physically the soldier ran the spear into his side blood and water came out proof of physical death and uh, so he didn't bleed to death and uh, wasn't his blood wasn't the literal hemoglobin that uh that saved us but it is an analogy. The bleeding of the animal is an analogy to the spiritual death of Jesus Christ. That is his judgment for us. The judgment of the animal was physical death. The judgment of Christ was spiritual death. That's a very important paragraph. And I hope that uh, you don't miss that. And I hope you appreciate that. Because I think there's uh, there's there are several Christians that are confused on that issue. Some pastors that are confused on that issue. And uh, I think if, if your understanding of that is, is diminished, 
And I think your appreciation for the, the fullness of, of our redemption is also diminished. All right, another work that he did was a reconciling work, making peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, where the things on earth are things in heaven. Again, it's the spiritual work that he accomplished while he was there, not the hemoglobin itself. Hebrews 10. So yeah, when we have these phrases, the blood of Jesus or the cross of Jesus or the death of Jesus, we, we, we recognize that those are idioms that express the work that he accomplished while he was there. All right. Yes. Yes, learn as much as you can on this doctrine because this is... Uh, this is profound. I think it's fundamental to our understanding of, of how we are reconciled. All right, we talked about the barrier last week, so these next couple of paragraphs are good review from what we talked about there. But the, uh, the barrier was completely removed. Any obstacle, any hindrance to us having eternal fellowship with the Father is completely removed, including the sin issue, uh, is taken away by the blood of Christ and uh, the work that he did on the cross. So, um, and this is true, by the way, for Old Testament saints as well. I like the way that the lesson goes into uh, Old Testament salvation. Um, it's all it is is a time perspective. They were looking forward, expecting for their Messiah to remove the sin. We're looking back, knowing that our Messiah, our Christ, did remove the sin. And so whether we're Old Testament believers looking forward or New Testament believers looking back, salvation is always the same. It's by grace through faith in uh, the faith in Jesus Christ. So we can appreciate that too. Nobody in the Old Testament was saved by butchering an animal or being religious or, or offering a sacrifice or any of the, the ritual that they were given. Salvation was always by grace through faith. Always has been, always will be. Here we have the other salvation doctrines, things that we've described in, uh, in other classes, the salvation grace doctrines, including redemption, which means to be purchased. We are purchased from the slave market of sin, and it wasn't uh, silver or gold that purchased us, but it was uh, the blood of Christ, uh, with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish, without spot. And uh, justification, to be declared righteous, to be declared uh, innocent. That's justification, which is a justification, a courtroom pronouncement. And we are justified by his blood, Romans 5, 9. So when you see all the work that the blood does, and they're, they're different. They all happen uh, at, at the same moment. They all happen in those three hours of darkness. They all happen there while uh, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit were all at work. Um, and then they were applied to each one of us when we believed, when we heard the gospel and believed and accepted the the uh, the gift of eternal life but the i think it's useful to describe these different doctrines to see that you know redemption is not identical to justification which is not identical to imputation which is not identical to reconciliation and and understand that all of these salvation doctrines propitiation all these uh salvation doctrines they're they're connected because they're all tied to the to the spiritual death of Christ on the cross, the work that he accomplished there in his priesthood, but they're not identical. They're, they, uh, they stress different elements of, uh, of God's work on our behalf. And uh, so they're all of God, they're none of us. They, uh, they're just powerful to dwell on and, and, uh, and very useful in, uh, in these ways. And, and there's more too, by the way, the um, the blood of Christ, this lesson doesn't go into it, but the blood of Christ is also um, the basis for what Jesus did in, Rome, in Hebrews 8 for when he ascended to heaven and he cleansed the heavenly temple. And so we read about that, that he went to heaven in, in the ascension after the resurrection, he ascended to heaven and he cleansed the heavenly temple. That's a different application of the blood of Christ which is different from anything we're looking at here in this lesson that relates to church age believers getting saved, but it is a biblical element nonetheless. And I think we, we can accept that. I think also the blood of Christ 
is uh, the basis for his uh, being the uh, mediator of the new covenant in the coming millennium for Israel. And so, because that also was work that he did on the cross on Friday, April 3rd, 33 AD, you know, he was doing so much in those three hours. And I think studying them separately, then studying them collectively, and then rightly dividing which of these works applies to the church that applies to you and me today as, as church age believers, and which of these works apply to Israel in the coming millennium, and which of these works apply to the angels, which of these works apply to the heavenly temple, which of these works, because he was doing so much. And the phrase blood of Christ is, uh, is used in, in all of these applications. And so in particular, when we talk about the, um, the reconciliation that takes place in Colossians 2, and, uh, and we see uh, that he's the creator of all things and the reconciler of all things. And um, that, um, we get to Colossians 1, where he's the creator of all things. Here we go. Colossians 1.20, through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, where the things on earth are things in heaven. And so there is a, a, a basis in the spiritual death of Jesus Christ on the cross that has a reconcil reconciling value both towards humanity and towards the angels. Because that's the uh, that's the contrast here in Colossians chapter one. He's the creator of all things, visible and invisible, in the heavens and on the earth, where the thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. So there's uh, there's applications there. And uh, anyway, studies like this are good, but then they also uh, where they really get good is when they open your eyes to where future studies need to go, where additional work needs to happen. And I appreciate these comments. Um, a couple of you folks have uh, commented already that that uh, there's more that we can be learning about about all of these doctrines, which is really good news. All right, so uh, make sure I don't miss anything here. the uh, The work of redemption is is the purchase price that's paid. The work of justification is the courtroom declaration that we are righteous. The uh, imputation is the crediting to us that actually we do credit, we do receive. The uh, righteousness of Jesus Christ, it's imputed to our account. Uh, propitiation, that the Father is satisfied, that uh, he is the uh, propitiation, he is the mercy seat, and uh, the Father is satisfied. Cleansing and restoration. Here we go. Here's what the blood of Christ does. First John 1, 7 says, the blood of Jesus, his son, cleans, keeps on cleansing us from all sin. And uh, that is a present application of the blood of Christ. That's happening right here, right now. That happens, you know, all day, every day. It, it, it happens as we continue walking in the light. So the longer we walk in the right, love the light, the more consistently we walk in the light. Uh, right here, right now, uh, I, I'm going to presume that we're in fellowship as we're taking this class. We're all walking in the light together. And right now, as this class is going on, the blood of Christ is now presently cleansing us. And that's uh, that's a wonderful truth. We can appreciate that. And uh, so that's a different application from uh, the blood that that saved me in uh, 1973. Okay, uh, 47 years ago when I became uh, spiritually born again. That was one application of the blood. But uh, today's application is is a brand new cleansing all day every day. And I I appreciate that. So. This study is helpful, and I hope this helps you. If you have any questions, let me know. But I think if once we start seeing that there are different applications of blood, once we start seeing, uh, like Hebrews 8, when he went to heaven and, and um, he entered the heavenly tabernacle, right? And uh, Hebrews 9, and he cleansed the, um, the heavenly temple when Jesus went up there. Here we go. Hebrews 9, verses 11 and following. 
When Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation. He didn't go into the, the Jerusalem temple. He went to heaven. And not with the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. And so he was able to cleanse that heavenly temple on the basis of his finished work on the cross. How much more will the blood of Christ through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So there is uh, so many applications that the application of the blood of Christ, the application of the blood of Christ. And, and when we talk about that and when we see a variety of applications, I find it useful when I sit down with somebody who is a little bit fuzzy on the new covenant. And I say, now, wait a minute. And the blood of the new covenant, has that been applied to Israel yet? Because it's promised to Israel. It's the blood that's shed for Israel in the new covenant. And it's uh, presently being reserved. It has not yet been applied, but it will be at the second advent of Jesus Christ. That blood will be applied to Israel and he will enter into the new covenant with the house of Israel, the house of Judah. That's the prophecy. And um, I think... Um, People get uh, a little confused on that because they want to put the church in the new covenant today. So there's the blood of Christ. Next, we have the body of Christ. Any questions? Am I going too fast? Everybody's still with me? I see we have some other join people that have joined us now. We're up to 19 presently in class, so that's good. Here's a question from Valencia. Yes, a couple of articles that make a distinction between propitiation and expiation. Can you discuss this for a minute? Sure. I think um, the toughest part is that um, expiation is a theological term that different um, people use in different ways. doesn't mean the same thing to, to two different authors even. Uh, so propitiation is the satisfaction of the uh, righteousness of God through the exercise of, of his justice, his judgment upon the person of, of his son. Uh, so that's, the, that's that. The expiation refers to the penalty. And, and so they are connected because Jesus accepted the penalty, but expiation is the penalty for a sin. Uh, in, in the case of, of, of death, the spiritual death for Jesus on the cross. So he paid that price, he accepted that penalty. And that's uh, that's what's spoken of there in most cases. Some people do different things with expiation. All right. And the body of Christ. Now, um, the body of Christ, as opposed to the blood of Christ, we're not talking about the literal body. Yeah, he had a physical body, and Mary birthed a, a physical body in the manger, and that was a, an infant, a newborn, and then he grew, and and uh, he had a, a physical body, a, an adult male physical body that went to the cross. He had a corporal form and a physical body, uh, but this class is actually about the church, the body of Christ, and uh, the privilege that we have to be baptized into union with Christ, and to be placed as a body part to be placed as a member of, uh, of the body of Christ. And so this, is, uh, this requires our Savior to be victorious, to be ascended, to be seated at the Father's right hand. It requires the Holy Spirit to be sent so that, um, that multiple human beings on this planet can then be um, in union, uh, placed in a positional bodily union with uh, with a savior who is not in time and space with us anymore on this earth. And so the body of Christ speaks of the, uh, the bride, speaks of the church. And uh, so each member of Trinity is related to the body of Christ and every Christian is a part of the body of Christ. Um, I love Ephesians for this. There's, there's present teachings on the body and future teachings on the body that, um, that a lesson today is not going to get into necessarily. I'll simply highlight them for you and and uh, tease you with them and then promise that when our Colossians series becomes an Ephesian series at Austin Bible Church, that uh, this teaching is going to go into some very deep places. So, uh, so stay tuned for that. But we're told that when Jesus was victorious, that he ascended and that he was seated, that... Um, 
We talk about the working of the Father's power, which uh, God the Father brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. So God the Father is the one who actually resurrected Jesus' physical body, glorified that body, and uh, caught it up into glory and sat him at the Father's right hand. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. Those are all angelic references. Above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. So keep in mind, he is already above these names in uh, the church age, but also in the one to come. And so uh, when he goes forth to rule in the midst of his enemies, and then when the heavens and earth are made new, and when he continues to reign above all rule and authority and power and dominion. And he has put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And so this is the church universal. This is the body of Christ. This is every born again believer from Pentecost, between Pentecost and rapture. So this is not Old Testament believers. It's not tribulational believers. It's not millennial believers. It's only church age saints. Born again, saved brothers and sisters from Pentecost to rapture. In other words, where we are now until the trumpet sounds, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And of all the different studies we've ever done on fullness, the uh, the blessing it is to see that we are his fullness is uh, is extraordinary because he's the filler and uh, we're his, we're the fullness. And, uh, it's a, it's a neat thing to, to see as it relates to Christ, not only in the church age, but also uh, after the millennium in the uh, new heavens and on the new earth. We also have mention of the body of Christ in Colossians chapter 1. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Uh, Ephesians 5, the husband is head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. He himself being the savior of the body. And so this head-body tandem, this is uh, important for us to see, the head-body dynamic that um, was not a reality for Israel. It was not, you had 12 tribes and uh, there was no head-body language uh, as it centered on Israel in the Old Testament. This is unique to the church in the New Testament. Uh, as the body is one, it has many members. So too is the body of Christ. And so we're all different members of the body and, and, you know, the foot or the ear or the nose or the hand or whatever, the eye, different body parts, different members. There's no member that should feel like it doesn't belong because uh, every member belongs. Every member is necessary. Every member uh, performs its designed function. And uh, we shouldn't grumble about the, uh, the body part that we wanted to be or the body part we wish we were. Um, we don't think that God make, made a mistake that he, uh, you know, that, uh, I think I'm a foot, but I really want to be a hand. And, uh, and I think, I, I think if I really want to be a hand, I should be a hand that, uh, I was really, I was a hand, but I was born in a foot body. So, um, I'm going to pretend I'm really, I'm really a hand. No, you're a foot, you know, uh, whatever you are is what he made you to be. And uh, that's his wisdom. That's his good pleasure to uh, determine these things. And then to place us in the body as he so desires so that we all function together and work together appropriately. And this is, this is great. This is um, it's a good basic doctrine here in 1 Corinthians 12. I think it's, it's fundamental to understand. I think it's simple enough to understand that uh, I, I enjoy this with, with small children. You can, you know, you can, you can talk to a three-year-old about, um, you know, their, their eyes and their ears and their nose. And you can say, you know, touch your nose and, and touch your ear, touch your other ear. You can, you know, the, the, the children are, are learning about themselves and learning about humanity and us. And, 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 and these are some of the, the very first things that, a, that a, a toddler, a young person starts to learn. And, um, and, and so to me, using this metaphor, Using this imagery to teach the interconnectedness of the body of Christ is just brilliant, genius on God's part to, uh, to teach us these things in this way. And uh, anyway, very unique to the church age. 
Christ is the savior of the body. By the way, us husbands better pay attention to. We should be willing to lay down our lives because we're commanded to love our wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Christ is the sanctifier of the body. He who sanctifies. Understand to sanctify means to set it apart, to designate it for a holy purpose. To, um, to uh, when, when God sanctified the seventh day, made it holy, when he blessed it, that's uh, what we're commanded to do for our wives, to set them apart, to sanctify them, to bless them, to um, to let our wives know that they are the one and only that uh, God has blessed us with, that that uh, that this is the this is the wife that I sanctify and I cleanse and I, I I minister the word of God, as it says here, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. OK, and this is not. You know, this is not sexual stuff of of giving your wife a bath in the tub or, or something, scrubbing her down in the shower. This is this is the spiritual cleansing of ministering the word of God so that uh, that your wife is is uh, sanctified and blessed. And you're the primary uh, husbands are the primary uh, responsibility for the uh, spiritual cleansing of their wives there. Anyway, pay attention to that, husbands. Good. Uh, marriage doctrine in Hebrews and uh, Ephesians 5. All right. Every Christian is a member of the body of Christ. Every Christian. And so it doesn't matter. If you're saved in the church age, this is, uh, you're a part of this. You get baptized in union with Christ and you're uh, you're sealed in this body. And so it's, uh, it's a neat thing. It's not something that happens to you later. It's not a second blessing. It's not something you work for or grow into. Every single Christian is a member of the body, and that includes Gentile believers and Jewish believers. I have a slight quibble with that. I know what I know what what is meant here when I read this, um, but you might even pencil in there former Gentiles and former Jews. That um, technically, if we if we really want to pick nits and be technical about it, um, every Jew and Gentile on the planet today is an unsaved unbeliever. Because the moment either a Gentile or a Jew gets saved, then they are uh, placed in the body of Christ in which they are neither Jew nor Gentile. And so uh, they become a new creation. They become a new heavenly people and a chosen people, a chosen race, a people for God's own possession. And so um, uh, it's, it's kind of interesting. And different authors will, will use the terms in different ways. I'm not trying to be ugly for this text. but just to, to pick a little bit of a nit here with this. Um, and then because we do have a phrase, either Jew or Gentile or church of God, right? And that shows the branches of, of humanity. And so, um, is that in Galatians 6? Jew or Gentile or church of God. Um, where is that? Oh, I shouldn't do this off the top of my head. If I can't quote the verse, don't quote the verse. Either Jew or Greek or Church of God. Jew or Gentile. Church of God. All right, never mind. I'll find it for next week. But give no offense. There it is. First Corinthians 10 32. Oh, Jews or Greeks or to the church of God. There we go. Thank you, Lord. So here, there's only three kinds of people on the planet, right? There's Jews, there's there's Gentiles, everybody except the Jews. But then there's the group that's neither Jew nor Gentile, and that's the church of God. So I love uh, I love this description in 2 Corinthians um, 1132 or 1032. 1032. All right. Hopefully I haven't lost everybody or confused you with that short side trip. Why are we a body in Christ? What's the point in being in the body? Ephesians chapter 4, he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers. So the apostles and prophets were around in the first century. They're gone now. 
evangelists and pastor teachers are still around today. And we appreciate that. The apostles and prophets were laying the foundation. The, the evangelists and pastor teachers build on that foundation. The church as a structure is, uh, I trust, very near complete. We're uh, putting on the final roof tiles now, the last, uh, the last bits of trim, the little uh, weather vane on the rooftop, whatever it might be. The, the final pieces of the church are coming together even now, even so come Lord Jesus. And, uh, but that's why we have pastors and teachers and evangelists for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ. And uh, this is what we do as a body, the building up of the body of Christ. It's not just so, you know, a handful of believers here and there can uh, grow in doctrine and get a bunch of knowledge and, and reach, uh, <clears throat> reach a, a maturity status of, uh, of ultra super grace or what have you. It's for the whole body to grow together. The building up of the body of Christ. And uh, that needs to be a, a mutual benefit for all the members of the body together in every lampstand, in every local church where members of the body of Christ are growing together. And uh, we can appreciate that until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. And uh, this is how he's designed us to be. Now, the purpose for this, notice, no longer children tossed here and there by waves carried about by every wind of doctrine i hate that that's you know the to me the blessings of of doctrine in the church the blessings of being a part of the body is that we are provided with stability we're not tossed to and fro that we are connected to fellow members of the body that we're very stable as we're united by faith that we're uh, stable in christ that are our, uh, our faith is grounded in the person of Christ, that our eyes are on the Lord, that we're not uh, in chaos. When I, when I see a believer in chaos, tossed here and there, when I see instability in a believer's life, I say, why are you letting that happen? What are you doing? The, the instability, God is not the author of confusion. Why, why is your life unstable when we're grounded on the rock? We're anchored. We enter within, within the veil. And, uh, Anyway, I, I've got an assortment of passages. This is tops on that list, uh, but I've got a list of favorite stability passages that uh, it's all speak to the the uh, the grounding that we have in uh, in Christ as we remain disciples in the Word of God. So um, we're not tossed by every wind of doctrine, trickery of men, craftiness, and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. And uh, I like what it says in the curriculum. The, ob the objective of the body in this life is to live the grace life. Speaking the truth in love, we're going to grow. And we're fitted together, the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies. According to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. And that passage there is what introduces the walk in verses 17 and following. And it's so practical that uh, we have the truth of our position in the body that then sets the table for how simple it is to, uh, to walk this walk, living the grace life. I love that, living the grace life. So we want to live the grace life. Okay, any questions on the body of Christ? the body which we are. Here's a question, how, how do you account for members who aren't growing in the church? Well, that's a problem, isn't it? And so that's why we need to um, exhort, we need to reprove, rebuke, exhort. This is the role of, um, the role of shepherds who uh, preach the word and be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort. Uh, the members who are stunted, the members who aren't growing. Um, is it because of sin? Is it because of laziness? Is it because of all of the above? Um, if you're feeding them, if you're walking them, if you're exercising them, if the shepherd is shepherding, then every member will be growing. 
And, uh, and if somebody's sitting there not growing and uh, just putting on an external show, acting like they're growing, uh, it really doesn't take long and that kind of shows itself for what it is. Honestly, this kind of teaching is very boring to somebody who's not feeding and not walking and not growing. And, uh, and they tend to not, not uh, stick around very long anyway, as it applies to that. Another question, does God move us around to other churches for the sake of our growth? Sometimes it depends. Um, Jesus does that. He assigns based upon where you are, what you need, where you are in your walk, but also what your gifts and ministries are because uh, you're gonna be uh, useful in, in edifying other brothers and sisters. And so, uh, yes, uh, Jesus is very free as head of the church to assign uh, different believers to different shepherds at different times. Uh, I usually go to 1 Peter 5 and talk about the allotting that happens there, nor yet is lording it over those allotted to your charge. And that phrase, those allotted to your charge, indicates that uh, the, these are the sheep that, that Jesus Christ assigns to different shepherds at different times, and those shepherds are expected to stay faithful. And that's uh, that's a good question there. Thank you for that. All right. Anything else? How are we doing? We're uh, all right. We're not doing too bad. No oh, man, I totally missed our halftime break. We're way past four fifteen, so we're uh, we're already in the home stretch, and we have one more topic to go. This is the topic on communion and the Passover. All right. The Passover feast became the communion table. And uh, I'm okay with that. I, I, could, I could pick a knit there too. But um, understand the Passover feast was a Jewish feast and it will be a Jewish feast again. Uh, in the tribulation, they will observe Passover. In the millennium, they will observe Passover. When you study the book of Ezekiel and, and other passages, when you have the temple and the animal sacrifices, specifically uh, one that's mentioned is exactly the Passover will be observed in the millennial kingdom. And uh, so uh, that might be a, a better way to express it than simply how it became the communion table. Now, it's true as church age believers, we do not observe the Passover unless we are uh, having a, you know, a cultural uh, blessing, right? unless we're having a demonstration of, of the Jewish Passover for us to understand the Old Testament. But uh, it's not commanded for us to observe the Passover uh, in the church. Uh, what is given for us in the church is the communion table. And Jesus did this. He gave the very first communion ever for his disciples. And he just happened to do it uh, at a Passover dinner in, at his last supper. And so, um, you know, and it was the elements were there. There was bread, there was wine. And so he taught the disciples how to use bread and wine as a memorial to look back to his finished work and to look forward to his to his pending work. And that's that's how I prefer to uh, to communicate communion as opposed to Passover. The one was a ritual that commemorated Israel's deliverance out of Egypt. The other uh, celebrates our deliverance from uh, from sin, that uh, that Jesus has saved us from the slave market of sin. We've been brought out of bondage just as Israel was brought out of Egypt. Um, they passed through the Red Sea, which closed behind them, so there's no going back. Uh, we are saved with eternal security, so there's no going back. Um, no one can ever lose their salvation, just like no uh, Israelite ever returned to Egypt. That uh, They passed through the Red Sea in a one-way door, and that's, uh, that's the analogy for our, uh, for our salvation. So uh, I think that these passages are useful. I do like the expression where Christ our Passover has been crucified. That's, uh, that's a good reminder there. That's 1 Corinthians 5, 7. He is our Passover um, in the sense that uh, we, weren't, we weren't delivered out of Egypt, but we were delivered from sin. And uh, so we can, we can commemorate that. We have to cleanse out uh, the old leaven, even as they did with their ritual. There's good, there's good material here. So um, again, this is where we look to the Old Testament and we see dead animals and we say, OK, there's doctrine being taught with those dead animals. Now, what's the reality? What's what's our understanding in the church? Because 
um, we have the once and for all sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We don't have to keep killing animals all the time, and we don't. We don't have animal ritual in the New Testament. So um, it's really nice how uh, communion gets to become the uh, the follow up to uh, the Passover. Jesus Christ gave himself willingly to become the final Passover. We already saw in John 10, no one takes it from him, but he lays it down, he takes it up again. He is volitionally serving in this capacity, Christ our Passover. Christ's substitutionary death on the cross provided the means to reconcile the world to God. This is by grace you've been saved through faith. It is not of yourselves. We understand Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. At the last Passover, Christ showed his disciples there would be no more Passover feasts after this one, no more killing of the lambs. And that's, that's a statement I, I would ask, uh, especially knowing that there will be future Passovers in the, uh, in the millennium. The Passover feast was just a shadow picture, an illustration of Christ himself. That's true. By the way, where in the Bible is the Last Supper called the Last Supper? Can anybody give me a verse on that? That's actually in the Bible text, not just a publishing blurb or not a theological label that was given uh, later in, uh, in church history looking back. All right. A shadow picture, an illustration of Christ himself. And I think it's useful every now and then. Go back to Exodus. Go back to uh, Exodus 12. See the night in which they were delivered out of bondage. See how they stood on their feet with, their, with the sandals on their feet and their, and their walking stick in their hand. They were ready to depart. And uh, the meal was taken in haste. See how they uh, smeared the blood of the lamb on the doorpost and the lintel. Go through that doctrine. Understand the substitutionary nature of it. Understand that the blood was the basis for their, uh, for God passing over in, in not judging, not killing the firstborn son. There's so much doctrine in the Passover night that then gets commemorated with the Passover feast as a memorial for Israel looking back to their national redemption. And uh, likewise for us in communion, that we have the ritual that looks back to the, uh, to the very first communion night when Jesus uh, was betrayed and when he, uh, when he went to the cross and, and purchased our, our redemption. All right. So uh, John 13, 4, got it from the supper, laid aside his garments. Yes, John 13, 4. Got up from supper. So before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, during supper, there's no question it was a supper, yes. And uh, they partook of the uh, Passover lamb. They had a lamb, they had wine, they had bread. You got it from supper. Yeah, but I don't think you're, you don't, you're not going to find that phrase, the last supper. Uh, unless it's a publishing blurb, it's one of these pericope headings that modern Bibles put in between their paragraphs to, uh, you know, these little blurbs up here, Jesus washes the disciples' feet. These are just paragraph headings. They're not written by God. They're not part of the original manuscripts. Even the chapters and verses, these numbers aren't, uh, aren't uh, written by God. So I think the... Uh, I think the uh, the same thing, we have the labels like the Last Supper or the Lord's Prayer or, you know, a lot of these expressions. And uh, we use them all the time. I'm just as guilty as anybody. I use these phrases all the time. But uh, sometimes I have to remind myself, stop, wait a minute. The Bible doesn't actually call it that. And, uh, and we want to be careful if we're going to, especially if I'm teaching a doctrine to a brand new believer that was just saved fairly recently. I don't want to, I don't want to trip them up or I don't want them to, uh, to be confused over why why we're taking communion and why we're not uh, to doing Passover. We have we have unleavened bread, we have wine or grape juice. We don't have a lamb. We don't have bitter herbs. We don't have um, the other elements of uh, of the Passover. 
So it is clearly, it's a different ritual and it has, and it serves a different purpose. Hebrews 10, this is the great chapter that shows how the law is a shadow and now the perfect has come. And uh, the whole chapter is good for this. This uh, mentions verses one through 12, but the law is a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of things. It's a preview of coming attractions. It's a way with an animal ritual to teach a doctrine prior to the reality of that doctrine being manifest. And, uh, and, and it's limited, it can't, it has no uh, intrinsic value. It doesn't save anybody. All it does is remind of sin every single year. It's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Hebrews 10, four, the blood of goat, blood, uh, bulls and goats, that didn't take away any sins. But um, Jesus did when he did his work on the cross. We just finished a Hebrew series. We took over three years to teach the book of Hebrews at Austin Bible Church on Sunday mornings. And uh, I'm, I'm so excited to have uh, that, the, those notebooks published now and the material sent out there because I think it's, uh, it's useful. Yes, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Christ our Passover. We talked about that earlier. Sacrificed on our behalf. And so this is what we do. Let me read 1 Corinthians 11. What do we do? when we eat the Lord's Supper and we, and we partake of this. And it says, uh, I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so we partake of this bread as a memorial, remembering our Savior's sinless perfection, remembering that he was qualified to do the work, and then declaring that he did the work. The unleavened bread speaks of his sinlessness, his qualifications. The cup speaks of his work, the blood of Christ, the work that he did. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so we, we remember that he did the work, but we also do this until he comes. As often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So in the church age, we, we are positioned uniquely in between first advent and second advent. We look back to what he finished. We look forward to what he has yet to finish. We look forward to what he has yet to apply. And what he has yet to apply is this blood of the new covenant that is still pending in its application to the nation of Israel. And uh, so we really, it's a, it's a privilege for us to proclaim that this is, uh, this is waiting to be done. All right, I missed a question here. Marisha wants to know, a minister requires members to have unleavened bread or crackers for communion. Is that necessary? I think, you know, it's, it's probably the best, but if it's not available, you use what you have available. For centuries, uh, Christians used just regular bread and it was leavened and it was baked and it was it was just regular bread. I think the verse here says he took bread and broke it. The word unleavened is not actually in this verse. Uh, we just know that it was unleavened bread because that's what the Jewish people used in their Passover dinners. So likewise, uh, churches can have, there's a variety of uses in uh, churches that, that have uh, unfermented uh, wine. Uh, either fermented or unfermented. So they either have uh, literal wine or they have um, grape juice. And uh, churches decide which is best suitable for their culture and for their uh, for where they live and for their people. And, uh, and different churches have different traditions on that. And they always have for centuries, they always have. And uh, different things that we started about two years ago, we started giving the option, at least until COVID hit, Austin Bible Church was giving the option whereby you could have fermented wine or you could have unfermented uh, grape juice uh, as, you, uh, as you preferred for your uh, partaking in communion. That was until COVID. Since COVID hit, we've been kind of um, using uh, these prepackaged sealed little kits so that everything was uh, uh, protected against germs and viruses and whatever else. And uh, so everybody gets their own little kit that they can unwrap themselves and uh, partake in communion without risk of any germs. 
There's another question. Since we're not together because of the pandemic, is it necessary to have any kind of bread, crackers, or grape juice for communion? We we did some virtual communion services uh, when we were streaming uh, before we returned to our building. And even now that we're back in our building, um, there's probably, about, I think it's 50-50 or 60-40. We still have a, a significant portion of our church body that uh, is still at home watching uh, on YouTube instead of instead of with us. So yes, they they watch it on the screen while we partake. They partake together with us, but that's uh, they do that at home with their own with their own uh, communion elements. Yep, good questions. I appreciate these. All right, so. It is a remembrance. It is um, a, a, a item of fellowship. It's also a very simple ritual. I like the fact that, you know, we have, uh, you know, we have a 90-year-old man in the church who takes communion with us, and he's been a believer for uh, over 80 years, and because um, he was saved in his youth, and uh, then we have young children that are with us, and they're taking communion, and they're you know they're uh, they're under 10 years old themselves but they're saved and they understand the doctrine and it's such a simple ritual that the whole body can partake together it's a great time of a fellowship it's a great mind a time of like-mindedness i appreciate it when i when i look out and i see grandparents with their children and their grandchildren i see two generations three generations even four generations together in um, in church on a communion service and it's uh, it's just a blessing to see these things, and it's it's a nice uh, it's a, just a simple beautiful ritual that uh, allows us to partake together. All right, well that's the end of the uh, lesson. Next week when we come back, uh, we'll be in Doctrine 107, where the doctrines include the Ascension and Session of Christ, the Holy Spirit Salvation Ministries, and the Holy Spirit Sustaining Ministries. So. Only three topics next week. I, I noticed the email came out earlier today, so you should have your lesson already. Take a look for that. Any final questions on this? Let me get your cameras back up. If you choose to turn the camera back on. Here we go. There's Ethel, there's Dylan, there's Elvis. Rob, Maria, all right. It's very dark where all this is. I'm suspecting that Elvis has something taped over her camera. All right, that's fine. All right, well, I wanna thank you all for being here today. Good to see y'all. Please keep our nation in your prayers, especially if, uh, for those of you that aren't in our nation, it's, uh, it's a blessing to pray for our nation as we pray for you. I was telling a group before we started the class today that I um, had some Facebook chats with some Philippine pastors this morning before church, and um, six o'clock in the morning here is eight o'clock in the evening there in the Philippines. So. Uh, they were already done with their Sunday for the most part, and and um, but I was talking to some pastor friends of mine and concerned because of the typhoons and super typhoons that have been going through there, and uh, everybody's in in good play, good shape, and uh, most of them are are uh, haven't had the property loss or some of the destruction that we've seen in the news, and but it was it was funny because every single one of these pastors that I was asking, are you okay? They uh, they told me they're fine, but then they asked, how are you? And they were asking about America, and they said they were praying for our mm -hmm. politics and the election, and they wanted to know what was going on because they said their news coverage was very confusing. And I told them, I said, it's very confusing here also. <laughs> and I said, just pray for us and keep it in prayer. And, and these Filipino pastors said, it kind of looks like we see cheating. Are, are there votes? Is there cheating in the vote? And I thought, well, it's pretty obvious if you can see it all the way from the Philippines, isn't it? You know, I'm going to tell them that. I'm going to tell them that my friends in the Philippines think that they see cheating from over there. And uh, anyway, so they're good men. I love them. And, and 
I went the first time in 2004, the second time in 2008, and I don't know when my third trip might be, but I do need to go back and and uh, and uh, visit those churches again. So, all righty. Well, let me close in prayer, and then we'll uh, end the recording, and uh, we will get this uploaded. It takes about an hour to uh, to get the the video compiled and processed, and to get it where it appears on the YouTube channel. So uh, give it give it some time, and it'll uh, we'll get it up there about an hour from now. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for these students and our time together. I thank you for the celebration we had at Austin Bible Church and the blessing there. It's just a testimony to your grace and uh, and your glory, Father. We thank you. We praise you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>